I'm here to talk today about some really cool secrets that I've learned um, about games and how they create engagement. So whether you're actually designing the next hit, you know, Facebook game or iOS game, or whether you are working on a portal or uh, some, you know, internet mail software, these are really keys from engagement that we picked up by really understanding what, create, what creates the fun that we feel when we play. And the basic idea is you can, if we can understand how games create engagement, these electronic experiences, we can take some of these lessons and apply them to other games and then also to other kinds of interaction. Uh, because what we've got is really, we're at this really wonderful time in that the, uh, the discipline of game design is really the future, it's becoming the future of interaction design. Games have been this hotbed of creativity for 30 years, and we've evolved into this wonderful interactive language. These interesting tools uh, that we, um, as game designers, have um, have all um, you know designed and shared. And I think there are some really important lessons uh, to be learned. So uh, why don't we get uh, started? I want to tell you a little bit about uh, who I am and sort of where my background comes from. Uh, so essentially, I'm of the uh, uh, I'm really of the Pong generation. I grew up in the arcades. I read every science fiction book in the St. Louis Public Library. I wrote science fiction universes that shared with that I shared with my friends. And it's the storytelling abilities and this you know this ability to live in the future that got me into Stanford, where I studied cognitive psychology programming and uh, a little bit of uh, filmmaking. And it's those three skills together that I use to take my clients to that next level of play. I rescued myself after Stanford from that ivory tower and went off venturing into you know, Silicon Valley, Bay Area. And for the past uh, 20 years, I've run uh, Zeo Design, where we do player experience, research, and design. So we look at what creates games engagement, and then we help our clients like EA, Ubisoft, Sony, uh, make, their games more, make their games more fun. Uh, we've also used this, uh, uh, we released a research, like uh, Shirley said, uh, on the uh, emotions of games and how games create engagement. It's called the Four Keys to Fun, we'll be looking at it a bit today. And we've used this to create uh, new types of games, actually new platforms. Uh, I used this model to create a game called Tilt. That was actually the very first game on the iPhone to use the accelerometer. And so with Joe Hewitt at iPhone Dev Camp, we created this new game, um, which, was, which was quite fun. And uh, now we've got a, a more advanced version of the game. Uh, so Zio Design is my consulting company. Uh, we've worked on Myst and The Sims. And then uh, Zio Play is our secret you know, uh, game design lab, which is where we're doing you know, game design to enhance uh, our knowledge and understanding of games and, and discover new engagement factors that we share with our clients. So let's get started. Uh, you know, how, can we, uh, you know, how can we create engagement? Uh, I think if we were all look at look around here, um, is that what we want to do? You know, is maybe you know spend a certain percentage of work. You know, work looks like this. You know, 20% work. I mean, our life we'd like it to look like this, where maybe we're working 20% of the time and 80% of the time we're having fun. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah, a little bit. Some people like that. Okay, you know, always, always game. <laughs> Uh, but in fact, what of course, it's reality is like this, you know, where we've got the, uh, the opposite spectrum where we're 80% work and maybe 20% maybe fun if we're lucky. So what we can do is we can look at games to create some sort of, isn't it, the promise is that we can use games to create this natural engagement. So making work, in a sense, work more fun and obviously making games more fun. And so the talk today is going to be looking a little bit on how, on how to do that with the, um, with the, un, by understanding the psychology of fun and what makes things engaging. So one way to improve engagement, one way to get people to rivet to the screen is to uh, add dopamine. And uh, what could we do to create this positive, engaged brain state? Now, uh, it's important, dopamine, by the way, is the uh, reward chemical in, in the brain. And uh, this won't be a neuroscience talk. This is my only neuroscience slide. Or maybe I've got one more. But uh, it's important that not only does dopamine reward the, the system, the brain system, but it also increases focus. And it's also released in love. And so those brain centers involved in love also release dopamine. So there's this really interesting thing of not just rewarding a player by you know, thinking of, hey, well, we're going you know, to trigger this. But there's actually some interesting other psychology that's going on, uh, neuropsychology that's going on. Uh, the biggest mistake we see in, in looking at, you know, trying to apply dopamine reward systems to uh, games like, or non-games like adding a badge, you know, you win, you add a badge, you add, you know, you get a little hit of dopamine for that, is that you can apply a lot of extrinsic rewards and you aim for addiction to those systems, you know, rather than fun. Uh, because you know Skinner boxes and just just rewarding the player uh, at different different times is in itself is not in itself an in fun fun experience. So we need to go a little bit deeper. 
Uh, and what we've got is what we're looking for is these positive uh, brain states. So those of you applying these game ideas to work, this is what we're really looking at, is that people, when they're in a positive, engaged brain state and not a fearful, like, oh, I'm going to lose my job brain state, uh, you're actually a lot more creative if you're in this, you know, a happy, engaged brain state. You're also more productive. So you're 50% more productive. You're generating more, in this case, in this study, you know, more sales leads. You're closing sales faster. All of these things are coming from being in a positively engaged brain state. So the idea behind adding games or this gamification, how many people have heard of the word gamification? Okay, yeah. And so the whole idea of you know, adding games, it's not just making the work a game, but it's really creating a, a brain state that then aids the, you know, aids the person you know, using your system, gets you going and, um, and you know, achieving the results that you want. Now, the, the really, really super good news is that uh, deep engagement with, uh, with content, deep engagement with a game, deep engagement with an interface is actually quite fun. And uh, what we find is that uh, Shik Sant Mahai did this research many years ago on flow, and he found that the best people's peak experiences, the absolute best moments in, in, the, in their life, were actually when they not, you know, sipping a, an umbrella drink under a tree in the Bahamas someplace. People's most favorite moments in life actually happened when they were deeply engaged in an activity that was challenging. And it's this interesting balance between difficulty on the vertical axis and uh, skill or time on the horizontal axis that is what creates this very intensely enjoyed you know, brain, brain state. And uh, in games, it's also the same way. So if you can imagine if you start a game and if it doesn't get very hard, you know you're going to leave because you're too bored, right? So that emotion of boredom, you'll leave. And if it gets, if it gets uh, too difficult too quickly, then you're going to leave because you are frustrated, right? And so what you want is you want to be here in the, uh, in the middle zone here where you've got this, uh, this white cone. You want the perfect balance between difficulty and skill. And that's when you get into a very engaged, uh, engaged brain state. So as we talk about game mechanics and as we talk about emotions for the rest of the talk, just think about what we're really doing is looking at um, trying to balance the player's brain state or the user's, your website user's brain state to create a very uh, intense, enjoyable um, you know, experience for them, to help them focus. Uh, so now what happens is, of course, I watch people play a lot of games. Uh, and the good news, again, is that there's no more reliable way to induce flow than playing a game. So let's take a look at how we get these positive um, things. Now, when I track the, um, when I'm tracking the flow state while watching people play games, I found out that there's many more things going on than just the balance of difficulty and skill. So how people enjoy games and what they get out of games is actually more than just their challenge, more than just their challenge. And that's where the four keys uh, come in. What we found is there was a wide variety of emotions, curiosity, you know, amusement, relaxation, excitement, um, the emotion of winning, the epic win, that yes, I just got the boss monster. No good word in English, so I use the word from Italian, fiero, like your body's on fire. And that's like, yes, it's personal triumph over adversity, something that uh, really only games can give you. Movies can't, books can't, but a game, it's actually, it's you that's saving the, it's you that's saving the princess. Uh, so this is what we, what we did, it's what we looked at um, to go deeper into what, what creates engagement in games is we watched people play. And then we sorted their favorite moments in games um, by the emotions they were feeling. How we did that is we measured the emotions on their face. So we used Paul Ekman's facial action coding, measured seven emotions in the face, others in the body, and then grouped them into what turned out to be four categories. So you had wonder, surprise, uh, desire, relax, schadenfreude, amusement. Uh, Nachus, which is this feeling of pleasure and pride when someone you help succeeds, you know, the mentoring kind of um, response. Frustration, fiero, relief. All of these different, um, different moments in games were, were different. They were coming from different, you know, different parts, different aspects. So we uh, then identified the engagement mechanics. So what kind of choices went with each group of emotions? So what kind of, you know, choices were involved in wonder? What kind were in schadenfreude? And then we created a map uh, that for designing engagement from this, from this data. So we worked from the players' emotions on their faces back to the types of choices they were playing or that they were making and then, um, and then created this uh, model. And we call that the, um, the, the four keys. And so these are systems for creating engagement. And we've used this uh, in our client work uh, to increase engagement, critical engagement metrics from anywhere from 20 to 40%. So not only did it come from players, but we've actually tested it and used it in our consulting practice over you know, the past, um, 
uh, of the past you know, 10, 10 years now since the models come out. Um, for example, eight games with one part will show they increase you know, these uh, engagement factors by you know, 20 to 40 percent. So we call these the four keys to engagement. And they are, if you can think about games, they are novelty, challenge, uh, friendship, and meaning. And the most engaging moments in games create these, these emotions. And best-selling games tend to have three out of the four, at least three out of the four. So think of WoW or Bejeweled or um, uh, Tetris or you know, Call, Call of Duty or uh, Team Fortress. They tend to have all four, three of, three of these four at least. Uh, and the, um, what happens is that the emotions come from the choices players make. So this model here, which is up on um, uh, 4k2f.com or our website, is that in the center you have the emotions that players are, or the, the actions that players are taking, and then the emotions that they, that they create. And so then with expert help, you can actually use this, uh, this model to help design choices, new types of choices that create that same engagement that games, the games deliver. Uh, so this is, a, this is a more of a close-up of the model. And uh, what we have is you want to have people uh, moving through these different, uh, these different aspects of play. So let's, let's, let's dive in. So watching people play games like Shik Semaha, we saw that the process of challenge and failure and trying again was an obvious source of engagement for, uh, for people that people got from games. So I could, I could take on the challenge, I fail, I try again. Games have a lot of really cool mechanics to get us, to motivate us, to do it again and again and again until we win. And it turns out, if you remember um, on that slide, is that you, the feeling of winning, that feeling of fear, doesn't happen unless you get so frustrated with that game that you're right at the top of that zone and you're ready to throw that controller through the window. And if you win at that point in time, that's when the arms go up. You know, you can't just push a button and win. You've got to feel really frustrated first. And so that's a little bit at odds if you think about UX uh, principles where you want to remove frustration, you want to remove obstacles, you want to optimize and reduce time on task. In games we create engagement by putting obstacles in the way that are fun to beat, by rewarding challenge, by making things hard. Uh, and so there's this really interesting you know, kind of balance between the two. Uh, so we found that uh, designers do these really uh, interesting things to intentionally cause um, failure and to reward it. Uh, the quick takeaway, sort of top level takeaway, is here are these, um, these, kind of, these three things. This is a screen from our game uh, Tilt World, which you play a uh, carbon eating tadpole. It's an eco game, and um, the uh, character uh, Flip eats carbon out of the air, chomp, 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 and then uh, gathers virtual seeds. And then we use those seeds to plant trees on the island of Madagascar. And so here Flip is, uh, Flip is the tadpole's name, uh, is trying to get the goal object. So we have a goal. Uh, we've got to use some strategy you know, to get there uh, because you can't touch anything that's got the blue, uh, that has the green blight on it. And then we have these obstacles, a restriction on time and then um, a physical obstacle. Um, and we have to go around, you know, but we have to go around. And so the, um, it may seem a little bit obvious, but by having those three things, at least those three things, it engages the game, the brain more than just being able to, oh, well, I just pick up that bottle cap, you know, to bottle, to recycle the blight. Uh, and so that it's these sorts of things, these are, these are ways to increase, increase what they call hard fun. Some common mistakes when people try and apply games to uh, uh, non-game uh, scenarios or even in games is that they want to you know, increase the challenge over time. Because again, you know, if the challenge doesn't, doesn't increase over time, you're going to quit because you're bored, right? Well, a lot of people send in more monsters and give you less time. But what players really want is they really want the strategy to change. So in a game called Dino Dash, where you play a waitress going from a greasy spoon to a five-star restaurant, you win level, the trophy for level four is a, um, is, a, is a coffee maker, which then completely changes your strategy for level five. And so having new strategy and new things to learn and new things to do, we want to level up in life. And so wouldn't it be cool if an interface could do that, where you could level up in Photoshop or in uh, you know, Microsoft Word or in Google Box or something, and you move from, from stage to stage. And we're actually starting to see software uh, developers actually take this on. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's hard fun. The next thing we did is in watching people actually play, like what did they actually do moment to moment? We could see the challenge, we could see the failure, the hard fun, and that was great. But then there's this other crazy stuff people were doing. You know, when I watched them play, you know, people were goofing around. They were, you know, they were driving the racetrack backwards. They were throwing their sims in the pool and pulling out the ladder to see what happens. You know, they were, you know, they were, <laughs> you know, they were trying to, you know, toss their angry bird the wrong direction, right? 
What was, you know, and they, what was this? Why are they, no, that's not what you're supposed to. Well, it turns out that, you know, off-track play, being able to, you know, try crazy experiments, being able to, you know, uh, if I give you a nuclear power plant, you know, as in a game, a nuclear power plant, what's the first thing you're going to try to do? Yeah, you're going to try for coral meltdown, right? Right? Why? Well, because it's fun, right? Not about challenge. It's, and I like to think of easy fun as really the bubble wrap of game design. It's the stuff, it's, the, it's sort of this optional activity. It's like scrolling your cursor across the bottom of the OS um, dock, you know, on, on, on Apple's OS X, uh, and you see those little things magnify. It's just fun. It's just, you, you could just do that all day. The joy of the controls, the joy of the experience. Or at least I could do it all day. Uh, and so what game designers do is they create systems to create emotional, emotional responses, which then in turn creates engagement, because if I'm feeling an emotion, it's actually easier for me to attend to something, to pay attention. I will pay attention to something that's making me feel versus something that's, uh, that, that's not. So what we do in that tilt uh, is that we, uh, here it's showing on the iPad, is we actually use the mechanics. So you, in the game, you simply tilt the, uh, the iPhone from portrait to landscape uh, as part of the controls. Um, and uh, I think I've got a, um, a video here. So here you can see I just tilt it back and forth and then I have to avoid all the green, you know, all the green blight and stuff like that. Uh, in order to play. So just tilting the devices, the controls, and the controls feel very fun. And so that's a great way to get easy fun. Uh, the buttons that you push on a, um, you know, in your application or in your game, those can have cute, we've got little cute splat noises in Tilt World. There's lots of things that you can do to, um, to make that process more engaging. Uh, a big mistake uh, for easy fun is not giving the fun failure state, like I talked about with the nuclear power plant. You know, we're, educate, we're making this educational game, and you just want to model just the right thing to do. And that would seem like a pretty good idea. But because it's a game, you know, it feels like a huge missed opportunity. It feels flat. It's just this golden path, and then there's no meat. On what Steve Moretzky likes to say, you know, there's got to be meat on the bones. There has to be something uh, a little bit more. So that's, that's easy fun. And easy fun is really about novelty. You know, hard fun is about challenge. Easy fun is about novelty. And being able to have new experiences, experiences I couldn't have in real life. So when we, uh, we continue on our, you know, in our research is we watch people play everything from Tetris to Halo, homeschool and work, young and old, and uh, we followed them home. And we found that uh, people were doing some pretty interesting things playing together. And it turns out the players tell us, it's like, well, people are addictive. It's not the games, it's the people. It's the people, it's my friends. I will play a game I don't like. I will play games even though I don't like playing games. I will, you know, play games longer because I want to spend time with my friends. And everybody's had that. Has anyone, like, you know, you, when you play poker with your friends, you, know, you have some friends that are like, we want to play poker. None of this social. And then the other people are like, no, we just we want to have fun to socializing while playing poker, right? Are you playing poker to be friends, to be social, or are you playing poker to play poker? So the people fun key is all about the social aspect. And the engaging, it's, they're highly engaging. They're highly engaging when played with, with other people. And so with people, we saw people, of course, trash talking, right, and having, um, having house rules, customizing their games to make it more fun for the different players, handicapping each other. And uh, there are lots of things about communication and cooperation and uh, competition to create more um, interaction. Uh, the emotion that we looked at was amusement. So if you have people playing a game and they're laughing, you know, chances are they've got a lot of people fun, you know, happening, happening there. Uh, amusement is a very fun emotion. Um, because it can, it's a really, it's a grouping emotion if you can think about it. When we laugh, we laugh with people, right? We laugh at other people. And so when we, when we, when we're with our friends, we're sort of grouping ourselves together by enjoying this joke. And then we can also make fun and ridicule other folks, and then that distance us, distances us. So there's this interesting um, phenomenon. Um, the other thing about um, uh, people fun is that if you have a, if you have an iPhone, if you have an iPhone. Uh, if I were to share my photos with you, you know, what would you do? You would, well, you would, you know, you tap, you pinch, you zoom, right, on the on the phone to see the photos. But you do, what would you, what would happen if I, if you did those same gestures, but on the back of my hand? We better be on a date or something, right? And how brilliant of Apple to put into the device, you know, gestures that create social emotions on a device that has your contacts, your emails, your Facebook. Right? Is that by using the device, by you know, by interacting with the device, you're actually creating social emotions 
that are enhancing the experience of contacting your friends uh, and interacting with your friends. And so that's the power of what we're talking about here. You know, not only are people addicted, but you can actually generate and consciously design the emotions that come from any interaction that you're adding to your application or your game. And then use those emotions to uh, enhance your, the, the key pillars of your brand, the uh, emotional states you need that person to be in to make that kind of decision, uh, to create the, um, or just simply to create you know, a more engaging experience that, that, rolls, that rolls through it. And so that's, um, that's where a lot of this, um, this goes in. So in group, uh, in group play we had, you know, people are, you know, people are essentially addictive. Uh, applying this to Tilt World is that we had a global scoreboard where the scores, um, the, the scores, all of the, the, the money, the currency that people collect gets put up onto a global scoreboard. And so we have players around the world. So we have players, you know, as many players in China as we do in the US. And uh, they're adding up to a world score. We're at 13 million Tilt points right now. And that at various points, we're using those points to actually plant real trees in, in, uh, on the island of Madagascar. So over Earth Day, we, had, uh, we just planted 10,000 trees uh, in, in, in Madagascar. Uh, and so you know, coming together around, um, around um, uh, with, you know, with your friends you know, makes something more, more engaging. So the last key is uh, called serious fun. And basically, people play serious fun to uh, create value through learning and meaning. Uh, we released this model in 2004, so we were doing, this was almost now 10 years ago. And uh, if we found that the best love games actually, you know, players got something, something in return for their play. So they felt that, you know, that while they could, waste, they could waste time and it was, you know, optional activity, they thought a lot of people were doing this quite intentionally, which I found completely fascinating. Uh, you know, whether it was the opportunity to blow off frustration at their boss by playing, a, you know, an action game, uh, whether playing a dancing game to lose weight or playing a brain training game to get smarter. People were playing games in order to get a mental workout to improve themselves or they're playing games um, like Tilt World to plant trees in, on the island of, of Madagascar. And so, uh, you know, what we've got is we've got, if you can think of, you know, we have that hard fun of challenge and mastery that, you know, leads to fear, like, yes, I just got the boss monster. Uh, that emotion is wonderful. It's one of the biggest fears, one of the biggest emotions we can feel. Uh, but it fades really quickly. And so what games have done, they've evolved this secondary system, this serious fun, to come up after the fiero and then provide additional value and meaning. And so you might think of it as badges, you know, you might think of it as, you know, achievements, you know, and that's one of them. But there are actually, uh, and that memorializes the win, you know, what you accomplished. Uh, yes, you, you know, flew your angry bird backwards or something like that. Uh, but then you get, um, uh, but then there are the things that stay with you over time. And it's this really interesting area that I think is uh, untapped by a lot of games. And then a lot of, um, in the gamification space or in the games uh, for change or when you gamify a UI, um, the serious fun is what's really um, is a huge um, is a huge opportunity um, because what it does is it allows you to um, be more than just the more than just the game. There's something more that's happening um, that provides uh, value and, and meaning. Uh, so in, in Tilt World, we've got uh, the object, this is the opportunity. We found that the game was uh, interesting, but we wanted to have this moment where we could um, sort of emphasize and tell the player, this is what you're doing. So in the center, is, there's a leaf here, which is full of coins that the players uh, collected. So these are the tilt points the players have collected. And then they can um, spin the wheel and uh, spin the dial, and then you get um, the crank, as it were. And then you can actually then donate, pull, pull coins out of that pile, and then donate them to a forest. And uh, that has, um, that environmental theme reflects parents' values. So it's popular with parents and, and kids. And so it's more than just the points, it's more than just the, the badges. People are playing because it reflects their values. So thinking about your own application or your own game, what is it, what kind of core uh, thing that's in common with your audience that people would really like to take away from that, that experience of that game? So um, in just uh, trying to you know, reach this a little bit further, um, play is really how we learn. If you just uh, take a moment to think about that, all games teach. You know, all games have some kind of message, some sort of skill that you acquire. And the purpose of play is, uh, in humans and many animals, is really to invent our future selves. So it's what we use to practice, it's what we use to, um, especially as kids, but, and forgotten, I think, a lot in the Western world anyway, in adults. 
it's you're, you know, you're playing around with ideas, you're trying on concepts, you might be role playing, you know, something like that. And these, um, this moment, although we as adults still need to be serious in, in the real world, um, using play, there's this huge opportunity to increase not only engagement, but then also to unlock human potential to play. And that's what Zero Design and Zero Play, my companies are all, all about. There's this wonderful, lots of interesting rat research. This is one by uh, Sergio Pellis and, uh, and his associates. And what they found is that rats that got to play with same age uh, younger rats growing up were actually better at handling novel, situ handling novel situations. They were better at problem solving. They had better social skills and uh, they were able to handle stress. The stress responses were, were, quite, were quite faster than those who did not grow up having you know, same age you know, play, playmates. So there's some really interesting stuff that happens in play on a deep neural level and not just the, um, you know, more that, that's more than just, uh, you know, hey, we're having fun. Hey, I'm learning my alphabet. Uh, there's some really interesting wiring that happens during, during play that, that humans and uh, other, other mammals are wired to do. So short is that there are a lot of good reasons to play and I believe, you know, we shouldn't stop playing as, as adults. So this is, what you, this is what you can do, whether you're designing software uh, or you know, a game, is take players through all four engagement loops. You can use that novelty to drive curiosity, wonder, and surprise, easy fun, to pull them in to your world. Then challenge them with, with uh, you know, something to accomplish. Provide them a goal, break it down into achievable steps. Uh, you know, give them feedback as they progress. Uh, use frustration and reward it with those you know, moments of fiera. Uh, create opportunities to socialize, uh, to communicate, and to uh, to cooperate, and uh, you know create amusement and um, uh, social bonding bonding emotions. And then, uh, lastly, to create uh, something that create experiences that creates value for the person, whether it's to reflect their values, like you know uh, uh, you know something like you know an environmental you know value that someone might have, uh, or that they um, allow them to have a concrete takeaway, like yes, they are learning you know they are learning this photo editing software you know much more quickly. Uh, you can do all of these things, and that will create uh, engagement. If you think about it, you know, when you get really frustrated with a game and then you have a bit of easy fun, you might just take a break from the challenge and then have something else to do. And then rather than using going somewhere else and doing some other activity, you still have something in, the, in that game to try out. So in World of Warcraft, you might go herbing between you know, missions. In Grand Theft Auto, you know you're on a mission from point A to point B. Well, at any point in time, like in Prov Theater, there's a lot of easy fun. They offer you, the game offers you a plate glass window. Uh, hey, a freeway exit ramp. I wonder if I can get my car under the top of that building. All of those are intentional design decisions uh, for people, they're the building blocks that, that people put together uh, in, in Easy Fun. So when you're thinking about applying um, Easy Fun, we've got this emotion from interaction. Um, it's enjoyed and remembered more. And so just having a cute little animation like this one with Flip, um, it just creates a, a little, a nice little, you know, nice little experience that can refresh the play experience or refresh, refresh your application. How players feel while they're interacting with your system, um, you know, really, really matters and can drive you, uh, drive things further. So think about what, what kind of feedback can your users, you know, use or your players enjoy all by itself. You know, how can this be? What kind of bubble wrap can you design into your, into your game or into your experience? And then the hard find is we want to reward from challenge, so that increases engagement. And so almost nobody does that right. Uh, you know, they give away badges for nothing, for logging in, not, you know, nothing that they have to really do. Uh, but if you reward challenge, you know, reward something that they actually accomplished that was hard, that's actually going to be remembered more. It's going to feel more significant because they actually had to do something uh, to do that. You need a clear goal and some strategy and re rewards and you know, progress indication. And then allowing people to connect, you know, around. It might be, seem obvious, you know, hey, we need virals, we need people to friend us on Facebook, but can they really interact? You know, is it a little bit more than just liking? Uh, you know, and if you um, be careful, because, you know, you've got some very interesting things like um, money erodes trust, for example. So if you have a social mechanic where I can give you, um, you know, where I, might, where I might be able to give you money or something like that, you have to be careful because like uh, if we're friends, you know, I might say, hey, I need to go to the airport tomorrow morning. Uh, and if we're friends, you say, oh yeah, sure, yeah, I'll take you. Um, but I can't say if we're friends, uh, oh, I need to go to the airport tomorrow morning, here's $100. That doesn't feel quite right, right? It feels, well, you know, no, you're doing it because we're friends, not because of the money. And so when we take uh, those, those social interactions, you map them into a virtual space, you have to be really careful. 
because money erodes trust and trust is the network that drives all the viral social interaction. And then lastly, we've got serious fun. So you want meaningful experiences are made more engaging. So what can you what can you use to enhance meaning? Whether it's you know it might be a um, it might be a charity drive, might be you know the planting of trees in Madagascar like our application, but it could also be you know just using rhythm and repetition uh, to get you into um, into a brain state that uh, you know makes you forget about the frustrating meeting that you just had with your boss. Uh, you might have something like a music game. You might have something that uh, allows you to do um, uh, to do more. But collection, repetition, ah, collection, repetition, and impact—all those are those are really great um, great things to um, increase engagement. And so, like in our game, you can uh, if you win an adventure pack, you know, if you win all 15 levels in an adventure pack, you actually plant a tree, and uh, that looks a little bit like this. Uh, we use what we do is we use Zeal's research to make something that's hard, like feels hard, like being green, like actually having an impact in the environment. Quite easy, because all you have to do is you just have to tilt the controller when you're playing Tilt World. So that's what that's what we're hoping for for, for Tilt World. So um, this is a, it's available on uh, iOS. Uh, Tilt World's available on, on iOS for the iPhone. And then uh, we've got our new game, uh, Lux, that's coming down soon. And it's about um, basically about Tilt World's about external change, uh, and uh, Lux is all about uh, internal change. So thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. And tag your.